Hello and welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I've practiced as a geotechnical engineer for over 18 years. And in addition to practicing engineering, I enjoy mentoring young engineers and first-generation college students. I focus on helping to increase the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields by STEAM, that's science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I'll be talking with Dr. Devin Mothersill, the Managing Director of GeoServe Global Limited, about ground anchor technology for engineers. He also will touch on what it's like to run a sole consultancy and also expert witness work. Dr. Devin Mothersill received his undergraduate degree in civil and structural engineering from the University of Bradford in the UK, where he also completed a PhD for his work investigating the influence of close proximity blasting on the performance of ground anchor systems in rock. He's a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers and the managing director of two specialist ground anchor consultancies, GeoServe Global Limited and Single Bore Multiple Anchor Limited that have successfully delivered services to clients across five continents. In recent years, he invented a unique and innovative software tool for iPads designed for the real-time analysis and management of anchor testing data, which is marketed under a separate company, Anchor Test Limited. He has worked as a ground anchor consultant in many parts of the world, including Spain, Australia, the Middle East, Russia, South Africa, and the United States of America, where he has advised clients on complex projects. We'll also include his full bio in the episode show notes for today. And with that, let's jump right into our conversation with Dr. Devin Mothersill. Well, Devin, welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. How are you doing? Well, I'm very, very well indeed, Jared, and I'm um, great to be here. Very grateful for this opportunity. Um, and I trust that the same applies to you as well. Definitely, definitely. Yes, it's good to see you again. It's been many years since the last time we've chatted, so I'm, I've been looking forward to this. Absolutely. I mean, we live in troubled times now, don't we? So um, <laughs> you're challenging times. So when you ask someone, are they doing okay? You can't always assume they're doing okay. So it's great to see your smile. Great to see that you're fit and well. Likewise, likewise. Thank you so much. So I introduced you to our listeners a little while back. And, um, you know, in your own words, can you tell us a little bit more about your career path? Perhaps maybe how you started and how you evolved into what I understand to be an independent specialist, geotechnical consultant and a business owner. Can you tell right. us a little bit more about that? Certainly, certainly. Well, you know, my story is a strange one because in many ways, uh, my evolution into geotechnical engineering started before I was born. Wow. Um, <laughs> that may seem strange, but my father um, was born and bred in Jamaica, the Caribbean island of Jamaica. Um, and although he wasn't directly involved in civil engineering, he always had um, a, a particular liking or respect for anybody who was developing the built environment. Always had that. And he befriended a Sri Lankan civil engineer out there who was dealing with drainage and that sort of thing. So moving the story on, he moved over to the UK in the early 60s, married my mother, and I was born in 1962. Okay. And I, I was christened Devon Kennington Vernon Mothersill. That's my full name. But the okay. reason why I mention it is because Kennington is a derivative of my father's first name, which is Kenneth, and this Sri Lankan civil engineer. Um, wow. so, so Kennington, and, and that's how my name came about. Um, and so as a young boy growing up, my father sort of introduced a concept of civil engineering to me. And um, as I went through technical college, uh, I chose the subjects suitable for that area. And I really didn't choose another subject area throughout my whole yeah. career. It was always civil engineering. Wow. So I went to university. Um, picked up um, the course in civil and structural engineering, which I was very grateful for because it gave me a very broad base. Mm -hmm. But even at that time, I wasn't focused on geotechnics at all. It was just general civil and structural engineering. But as I reached my final year and I had to do a dissertation, that's when something triggered in me about soil mechanics. I seemed to just take, I just took to it, seemed to like this subject. And I did a final year dissertation 
on the behavior of reinforced earth retaining walls. Wow. And at that point, when I completed my degree, I was all set to head out to industry and just carry on my career. But something very fundamental happened at that point. Um, a gentleman called Professor Stuart Littlejohn took over the department at the university. And my supervising um, uh, uh, lecturer presented my final year thesis to him, which he read. Then he invited me for coffee and a chat and invited me to do research with him. And so I went along a path, a bit skeptical at first, but mm -hmm. he wanted me to do research, heading towards a PhD in geotechnics and reassured me that um, any concerns I have that this is going to be overly theoretical would be really unfounded because he, he, he had a really big thing about collaboration with industry. Mm -hmm. So he chose a subject where, um, which obviously involved ground anchors, but it involved a commercial tunnel, direct collaboration with industry, um, this tunnel was being blasted through rock. The whole roof of that tunnel was supported with rock bolts and the outer portal had anchors in it. And so the whole thing was based on looking at the influence of close proximity blasting on those support systems. And that was my, my sort of segue into, into geotechnics. Got the PhD, left the university, went out into industry, worked there for about eight years in an American company, Brown and Root, as it happens. <laughs> and that allowed me to get chartership, um, which is equivalent to, I think, your PE status <laughs> in, in, in the United States. But I became a chartered engineer. And at that point, um, during that process, I realized because I kept in contact with my old professor and he had actually left academia and became an independent consultant. <laughs> and I think that triggered me because about four years later, I decided to make the same move. Wow. And I then left that. I wasn't well networked at the time and many people were skeptical, but he was very supportive of that. And I left um, and formed an, 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 an alliance with another colleague of mine who was like-minded. And I even remember our, our sort of our motto. It was a combining efforts to achieve excellence. That was on our letterhead. And okay. even though we're independent, but we worked as a partnership, launched into industry on a, on a, on a project, and then we just progressed it from there. It was a, a fascinating journey and I've never looked back. Oh, that's great. That's great. But four years in, after the PhD and working, you felt like it's time. Well, well, well what happened was, um, you know, it was, um, I, I finished the PhD, mm -hmm. worked for the, uh, the, the company um, for eight years. Ah, uh, okay. Um, but, but four years into that, I became chartered. So four I years after you. chartership, that's when I decided to, to, to make that move. And, oh, um, and it, it was a fascinating thing that I've never regretted. Never regretted. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we have a lot of listeners. Some are more seasoned, uh, but some are just, you know, some are finishing school and sure. just starting out. So they might not be familiar with ground anchor systems. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about these? You know, what are they used for? What are they? What are they used for? Uh, when would you see these? Sure. Sure. Well, essentially, a, a ground anchor is a technology um, or an installation that we uh, place in the ground, be it soil or rock, and mm -hmm. it allows us to tie structures on the surface of the ground to more stable ground beneath the surface. And that's mm -hmm. the basic principle. Um, essentially, uh, the system comprises something called an anchor head, which is a bit of the anchor system that you can see. Mm -hmm. Not always the case, because sometimes they're buried, but usually you can see that, and that's attached to the structure. Then you have the other component, which is what we call a free anchor length, which transfers load from the surface, which is attached to the structure, through the ground to what we call a fixed anchor, which is bonded to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the essential parts of the system. The analogy I like to draw is if you um, approach the uninformed and mention the word anchor, the first thing they think about is a boat floating on water. Um, where if you don't want to float away, you throw something over the edge, it hooks into the seabed and via some sort of rope and an attachment to the boat, you don't float away. Yeah. So a ground anchor works in a very similar way, but we're not attaching it to boats. We're attaching it to structures on, on the surface. And in particular circumstances or special circumstances, we're, we're tying unstable ground at the surface to more stable ground beneath the surface. And that's the essence of a ground anchor. The important thing is not to confuse it with something like a soil nail, yeah. um, which is a completely different system. And without getting into detail, a soil nail ties soil to soil and it works in shear and bending and actual force. And it's part of what we call a ground reinforcement tool, as opposed mm -hmm. to a structural element 
which is what uh, a grand anchor is. So hopefully that helps our listeners. Uh, that was great. That was great. Now, when you look at the projects you're looking at, are you working on mostly uh, anchors that are being installed for temporary conditions, such as like supportive excavation at the perimeter support, or are you doing more permanent? I mean, wh- where do you, Both. what do you see as a breakdown? Both. 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 I mean, okay. I mean, if I couldn't even put it, I couldn't even divide it in terms of percentage, really. Wow. But but it's completely mixed. You know, I'm called to look at um, temporary systems and permanent systems. Okay. And, you know, ground anchoring as a technology is well known in the industry. Mm-hmm. And um, generally, companies can deal with routine ground anchoring. But they were calling someone like me a specialist where things don't go wrong or where they're in ground, particularly weak ground, and they want to generate high capacities in that weak ground, and they're not, they don't have that knowledge to do that. The other part of it is if something goes wrong with the anchors and they need a sort of forensic analysis or study of that, then would, they would tend to call in a specialist. Or if something goes very, very wrong and there's a dispute and they need an expert witness to preside on that, that then I would come in on that as well. But to answer your question, generally it's, it's temporary systems and permanent systems both. So when, you, when you, we're talking about these anchors, are you seeing more strands? Are you seeing more threaded bars? Or I mean, is, is there one, are you seeing more of one or the other or is it pretty equal? Well, well um, I would say we're seeing, in my particular experience, I'm seeing more strand systems, but I've okay. dealt with monobar systems, you know, on, on a regular basis as well. But okay. because I um, have a particular speciality in post-tension dams, they tend to be stranded systems. You don't have couplers involved there yeah. because the lengths are very, very long. Exactly. And so strands are more suitable to that. And because of the high capacities involved, which can get up almost to pile type loading, um, you're dealing with very high load these systems and strands are more suited for that. But don't get me wrong. You know, we've dealt with bars, um, monobar systems of, for, from very small to, to very large. Um, okay. You know, um, three diameter systems, right, right, right down to one inch and, and, and below. So, you know, it's varied, but I would say strands tends to take over the, the majority of my workload. Okay, excellent. And where, where in the world? I mean, you're covering all over or certain regions? All over the world, all okay. over the world. What happens, Jared, when you're a specialist, you find mm-hmm. that it would be unwise to confine yourself to one particular region or country. Very well. Otherwise, you wouldn't eat. Um, so, so, so basically, um, I've made the world my marketplace. Um, mm-hmm. I don't regret that. It, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it becomes a, a lifestyle choice, uh, the way I work, because I'm able to travel the world solving problems. And my wife tags along as well on the majority of projects. And, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, so you, you're dealing with different cultures, languages, methods of working, and different philosophies of working. And you have to sort of embrace all of that and apply a logic through the whole system to get the, the anchors to actually work. And That's so, awesome. um, yeah, the world is my marketplace. That's awesome. And, you know, we talked to a lot of people on the show. We have, we talked to people that work for big firms, mm-hmm. some that work for small firms, but as a sole consultant, I mean, how does that work? How does that work <laughs> as a sole consultant? It, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I, yes, I, and that's the right term to use. I'm a sole consultant because it's essentially just me. <laughs> but, but that wouldn't be really accurate because sometimes when the job gets very, very big, on, on occasions I've engaged the services of others and then released them. So okay. I call myself a sole consultant because I don't conventionally employ people. So I could have taken that route. I could have built a company where you employ people. But then what would happen? I'd be, you know, um, as a company gets bigger, I'd be rewarded with more managerial experience, which isn't really where I wanted to go. I'm, I'm a problem solver. And so I took the route of being a sole consultant, but I've employed companies and I've okay. employed individuals on different occasions, depending on the nature of the project. Um, sometimes a client may require me to, um, g- you know, go on a certain job site and observe a certain grouting process. If I can't be two places at once, I have trusted people. Um, independent freelancers who are specialists in that area who I can engage their services for that. They can then report back to me. Um, On other occasions, I've had to do forensic um, corrosion analysis on a project. I may engage the services of a specialist corrosion company to join me on site where they can do certain tests and then I report on that. So it it, it varies. So whilst I am sole and I don't employ people, but I do engage people and, and release them. And I think it's probably important to mention as well, um, I'm also part of something called the Geotrust Network. 
which is headed by uh, a Dr. Donald Bruce, who I'm sure you would have come across. Yes. Uh, he's based in the States, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's a collective of professionals who are also freelance. And it, uh, it really provides a resource, essentially. So if any one of us uh, requires the expertise of another, we can call upon that pool, that resource, and then execute the project as necessary. So it's very, very useful. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And if one of the listeners wanted to take this approach of, you know, running a consultancy, what are some tips that you would give them? Some advice, maybe some right. things that, you know, if you could do differently, you would do differently. What are some things you could share? Right. Well, the first thing is you have to decide on your business model very, very carefully. You know, being, a, you know, a geotechnical consult consultant is a wonderful career, but you have to decide, do you want to build a consultancy where you're going to employ people? And that has pros and cons. And it's a, a great thing. You can in, build a company from an embryo right the way through. And it's a wonderfully satisfying thing. Yeah. But I find that it doesn't give me the flexibility I desire in terms of um, traveling the world in the way I do, um, you know, interacting with different cultures, solving problems in a very flexible way. So once you decide on your business model, um, which is a very, very important decision, then you can take things from there. Um, you can take the approach I've done by networking effectively so you can build a resource that you can tap into because believe you me, no matter how good you are, as an individual, you can't do everything. And sometimes when, when the jobs come in and people need you to be in one, you know, uh, you know, two places at once, it's just not possible. And you have to do what I mentioned earlier by engaging mm -hmm. other people's services. I remember in, in one year, I actually made 14 international trips in, in a 12 month period. So, but that's my choice. And as I said, my wife tra traveled with me and it's something we've decided to do. So it's very, very important from the outset. If you're going to take this route, decide where you want to go, because that sort of movement doesn't suit everybody. Right. Family, my kids are grown up now. So, so there's not that commitment. It's just my wife and myself. So it works for us. Excellent. Excellent. And I understand you do quite a bit of expert witness work as well, right? I do indeed. I do indeed. Um, is there is there an interesting case that you can share? I know sometimes you can't talk about it, but if there's a case you could talk sure, about. Sure. Okay. I mean, the first thing I will say is that as you develop in your career and you develop in your expertise level, expert witness is something that or expert witness work is something that will confront you at some point. And some people <laughs> choose to do it. Others choose not to do it because it's certainly not for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's very rewarding, but it can be a very stressful and nerve wracking experience as well. <laughs> so, you know, I would I would say, first of all, as a tip, you know, it's a given that you should know your stuff. You have to understand your field because you wouldn't be called in as an expert otherwise. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, decide whether it's whether it's something that suits you. Because often the opposing barrister can attack you personally and people can't take that. People can't take that. So yeah. I find it's what's very important is that you need adequate training separate to your profession. It's wow. not enough to just know your stuff. You have to know how to present your case, present information in an effective way that suits the court, knowing right. that your obligation is not to your client who employs you, but to the court itself. Yeah. So often if I get called an expert witness um, job, the first thing I say to the client is, okay, fine. If I take this on, obviously I'm going to be looking at it objectively, but my findings may not be in your favor. Are you prepared for that? Because some people, some people feel that as an expert witness, people just call upon you to defend their case, yeah. but your obligations to the court. So what you have to do is look for the engineering truth, mm -hmm. find that, and that may not be favorable to your client. So wow. you have to declare that at the outset. And it's something that's a point people often miss. Um, Interesting thing for me is that one of the cases I, I was involved with was a, a series of defective anchors in, in a marine environment. Okay. The client who um, employed my services were the owner, okay. but the contractor, well, they were in dispute with the contractor. And my opposite number happened to be the professor who taught me at university. <laughs> so that's a very interesting dynamic. Wow. Um, where you're walking into an expert witness case where you're reviewing the report of someone who taught you. And, um, and so, you know, and people often say, how do you handle that? Yeah. You know, you're looking at this person, you, you have tremendous respect for them. Yeah. But strangely enough, I've never seen it as a, a problem because yeah. I've never seen it as me versus a person. <laughs> Although it can be perceived as that, I've okay. never seen it as that. You're there, your obligations to the court and to find what I call the engineering truth. Something mm -hmm. has gone wrong, which has caused a dispute. Yeah. And your objective is to find it. 
and you trust the other side to do the same. And in this case, there was no problem with his integrity. I trust him implicitly. And we just aimed. Yes, there were agreements and disagreements, mm -hmm. but this is done in a professional manner. And we're aiming for the truth. What the causation, what caused the defects and that sort of thing. But that was a very interesting dynamic. Um, and you have to just be aware of that. that. That can occur sometimes. And as you as you narrow down in your specialism, you'll find that colleagues or friends could mm -hmm. end up being your opposite number. And it, it can it can happen but you have to take a professional platform and, and prevail regardless. You're absolutely right. And that's so important when we think about engineering, what it means to be a professional engineer or a chartered engineer. A lot of times we focus on the technical aspects, but there's so much that ties back to the professionalism and also the ethics. The ethics, Absolutely. you know, you're, you're saying I'm not here to prove my client was right or wrong. I'm here to figure out what the truth is because something happened. What yes. happened? Yeah. Oh, and there's excellent. a legal obligation to do that. And yep. that's why I recommend that anybody who goes into this line gets additional training. I took a, a separate master's level course on wow. expert witness evidence, specifically okay. that. So it's separate from geotechnics, separate from civil engineering, but it's purely to train you in the art of delivering information. Um, interesting story. We just have time. I could tell yeah, you Dur please, during, that course, during that course, during that course, we all had to all introduce ourselves, the, the, the attendees on the course. And, and they said, tell us a little bit about yourself and any experience you've had in expert witness work. Mm -hmm. And I introduced myself and I mentioned the fact that my opposite number happened to be my professor, the job I just talked to you about. Yeah. So the, 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 you know, the, the convener for the course noted that. And later on in the afternoon, um, she was a barrister. And she said, right, what we're going to do is a little bit of role play now. Can we have a volunteer? And everybody was sort of looking around sheepishly and she picked on me. So I said, okay, fine, let's go for it. So she goes, what I'm going to do for the benefit of the course, I'm going to take you through a scenario where I'm going to cross-examine you. And I'm just going to, you know, we're going to learn from it. Are you happy with that? So I said, sure, okay. So I sat back a bit nervous. So she then said to me, um, right, okay, um, scenario. Okay, Dr. Mothersill, here we have um, th this case here and you've presented your report. But it seems to me that your opposite number happened to be the professor that taught you. How do you expect the court to, to go with your argument when, you know, your opposite number is presenting a completely different argument? Now, that completely, Jared, it took me by, and I'm saying this because I hope the audience can benefit from this experience. Yes. But, you know, I, 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 I was stunned by this and I started, I wanted to buy myself time. So yes. I said, um, right, okay, well, well, it is true that Professor Littlejohn is an eminent professor and he's very schooled in his field. And she cut me short and said, no further questions. And, and I was stopped and the whole class started laughing Shit, because I fell into the trap trying to buy myself time. I was oh. repeating and reiterating what she said. And wow. the learning point from this was she said that what you should have done is ignored what I said, simply stated that you have the experience, the expertise to conduct this case objectively. Talk about wow. yourself. But what you did in buying yourself time, you reiterated my point, which, and we all burst out laughing, but I tell you, it was a harsh lesson, yes. a harsh lesson, but a very, very well learned one. No question about that. Well, so. excellent. Thank you so much. It's like, you can see how many of us fall into that same trap, but hopefully somebody's listening there. They're, they're, they'll be one up now. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, thank you. Well, when you, you I, would, I, I want to ask a question now about the current environment we're in, right? We're, we're living in, you know, the we're still in a pandemic. Indeed. How have you Indeed. found that, you know, how have you worked during this time? Because again, I remember you said, you know, 14 trips internationally mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. one year, but how are you doing things in the pandemic? Are you moving right. around as much? You sit still more? Like, how's that working for you? Well, well, uh, sitting still is a very good way <laughs> to put it. I mean, obviously it's been challenging and because my, the nature of my business is rapid response where I can travel anywhere in the world, that had to stop because we were on lockdown here in the UK, and many parts of the world. And so it was challenging, but you have to, I find the key in these situations to be flexible and adaptable. And you have to evolve and be innovative in the way you treat work. Um, I know when the lockdown started in, in, uh, you know, for us in early um, 2020, I was due to fly out to Australia to look at an anchored slope, which was failing wow. um, potentially. And um, what I had to, because I couldn't fly, what we decided to do, we used drones to fly over the site. They wow. did, they used a technique called aerial photogrammetry, took a, a series of digital photographs, created a 3D model of the slope with the anchors in it, sent yeah. it to me. I was able to study this slope, rotate it on my screens, 
identify the faults or crush areas of rock and identify the particular anchors suitable for subsequent detailed investigation and inspection. And I was able to write my report remotely having not even gone to the site. Yeah. So obviously it caveated, you know, to the fact <laughs> that I haven't visited the site, but really it was a way in which we're able to adapt to the circumstances we were confronted with. You know, I had another situation where um, I had a, 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 a contractor in Italy who were, we were introducing a new type of anchor technology to, which they hadn't seen before. But what we did, we set up, and I was supposed to come over to demonstrate this because we had a mock-up, a simulation in a factory. But obviously I couldn't travel. But would you believe using an iPhone, an interpreter and FaceTime, okay. I actually supervised the whole process via FaceTime in real time, talking and really the, the, the contractor, there was a language issue. So we even had an interpreter to complicate things even more. But we, we soldiered through it. No question about that. We got through. So I think the moral of the story here is, yes, the pandemic is, is going to hurt. Yeah. But good times will, will return, I'm sure. But in the meantime, be flexible, be adaptable, and you'll prevail. No, no question about that. Excellent. I love it. I, I, you know, a lot of people are talking about silver linings and being able to pivot. And that's, those mm. are two great examples of how you're able to adjust mm. in real time and still solve the problem. So that's you great. Do. You do. Wow. Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, before we uh, pause, I want to ask you if you could just share what you share with the listeners. What do you think is on the horizon? We think about what's the future for ground anchor technology. I mean, what's, what's mm. on the forefront? What's on the future? Right. Well, I mean, Interestingly, I would say, you know, just looking right across the board, geotechnical engineering is slow compared with many other industries in adopting change and new technologies and that sort of thing. Um, certainly compared with other, other, other industries. But one of, the main, one of the main issues that faces the Grand Anchor um, industry right now is something called legacy anchors. Hmm. And those are essentially anchors that were install, installed historically maybe 40 years ago or so, um, with corrosion protection systems that when you judge them by current standards would be deemed inadequate. And they'll be just, you know, um, deemed to be temporary anchors, but because of the state of the corrosion protection. And often these anchors are systems which are not restressable, so we can't check the loads in them. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what do you do with those systems? How do you monitor? How do you make judgments in those systems and that's something that our industry faces particularly in the dam industry and i know in, in the north american dams it's a big issue as well yeah. so i believe that the future is going to be centered around largely about dealing with legacy systems dealing with um, technology that can allow us to assess the adequacy and, or, or, of existing systems that may not be um, compatible with contemporary standards and that's where I think it's going to go. Um, I have also looked at digitalization of data and I've created a, a software package um, on, on iPad um, mm. for anchor testing. And I think that's another route as well. You know, we don't need to be cutting down trees and filling in, um, <laughs> you know, uh, pads on site. Well, you know, you can digitize data, send it to the cloud, analyze things in real time. And this is something I've sort of um, made, taken a lead in, particularly where anchor testing is concerned because often you have a lot of anchors on site and a lot of data is coming through and you mm -hmm. need to make decisions quickly. So yeah. if you can look at, um, you know, put your laptop to the side because that's not really compatible with site work, mm -hmm. but have something like an iPad in your hand, you know, robust, you can get data immediately, make decisions quickly, and that can facilitate, you know, um, the construction cycle in a much more efficient way. So those are a couple of pointers to where I see the future of the industry going. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we're going to pause here. We're going to come back in just a minute and close this one out with Dr. Devin Mothersill and our Career Factor Safety End segment. Stick around. All right. Welcome back. It's time for our Career Factor of Safety End segment. In geotechnical engineering, like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're talking with Dr. Devin Mothersill. Doctor, you've already had a very successful career. And when you look back at your career, what's one thing you implemented in your career that you think gave you a factor of safety for success? Right. 
Interesting. Interesting that you use the term factor of safety. I've always seen a factor of safety as this relationship between capacity and demand. Yeah. And if the capacity is high and the demand is low, the factor of safety is a lot better and it won't fail. So what's going to cause me not to fail in my career? <laughs> you know, when I look at that analogy, um, the demand is my lifestyle, what I want from the career, my self-satisfaction in the career, and the capacity is maintaining the, the level of workload. Mm. Um, you know, and this is where I think, you know, what's one tip I would give is the business development aspect, where, particularly when you're a sole uh, consultant. You know, many sole consultants will look at the situation and say, you know, the situation you don't want is to be staring at your desk and you're wanting the phone to ring. You, you don't want that. And luckily, <laughs> I haven't actually experienced that. So the way to mitigate against that and keep that factor of safety high is to, to constantly network. You know, my old professor once told me that if there's ever an opportunity to speak, even though it may not be comfortable, speak. This means conferences, that kind of thing. If there's an, ever an opportunity to publish, we're all busy, but get those papers out. If you do something good on a job, tell the industry about it because it develops your personality. It builds your network. And that's the important thing. And it's all part of business development. Yes, we know about the websites and the social media and all the rest of things, but people need to see your personality. They need to believe that you can do the job. You need to project yourself out there. And things like um, conferences, public speaking engagements, publishing particularly, it, it, it's a very important thing. At the moment, I'm engaged in actually writing a book, which, which is another thing, wow. a, a textbook. A How textbook. do you have time to do that? Oh That's gosh, awesome. you, find, you find the time, you find the time. And it's challenging. Mm. Um, obviously lockdown has helped as well, but um, I'm in the process of doing that. And um, that's going to be launched into the industry. It's, it's, it's entitled Grouted Soil and Rock Anchors. And it's going to really cover all the aspects of design, construction, um, testing and monitoring. And um, again, it's about projecting your profile out there. Yeah. So to keep that factor of safety high, keep the capacity bigger than the demand, <laughs> you know, um, excessive networking and, of course, continual professional development as well. You know, Excellent. attending courses and that sort of thing. What do you think is the timing on that textbook? Are we weeks away, months away, years well, ago? Well, well, I can tell you accurately, the manuscript, it was actually okay. a three-year project. It was a okay. three-year project with Taylor and Francis, the, the prolific publishers worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're one year into that project at the moment. So, so I've got two years left and we're just dealing with these chapters, doing all the necessary research and pulling that information together to really offer the industry something contemporary um, yeah. about this technology. So look out I for that I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait. Look out for that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Devin, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for sharing all the great insights with us. You share some great information. I know this advice is going to be helpful to our listeners. If a listener wanted to reach out to reach out to you, what's the best way to find it? Email you want to share or social media? What's the best way for them to find you? Sure. Well, um, my websites um, have all the information on that and that's yeah. um, geoserveglobal.com. Um, geoserve global as one word.com and single um, SBMA systems.com. Um, so those two websites have all the contact details uh, available on that. I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So just Devon Mothersill on LinkedIn and you can pick me up there. So no problem at all. And in addition to that, if you were to look at um, devmoth, D E V M O T H at AOL.com, that's my direct email any technical questions, anything that's come up as a result of this, I'm happy to answer it. No problem at all. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. This is great. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, episode 23, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.